Hello and welcome back to part two in my series of videos where I go through all of the features and services of Synology NAS in DSM-7 as well as going through how to set up a number of its key software and services. Now I know this has been quite a long time since part one, lots of other projects have got in the way so I apologise for how long this has taken. Um, so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at backups and synchronization. We're going to look at a number of the key applications and how to set the majority of them up. We're going to talk about some enterprise level stuff uh, known as uh, where you connect with SAAS services or software as a service. We're going to be looking a little bit at virtual machine synchronization and backups and more important than anything else we're going to talk about the main difference between synchronization and backups because I think these two terms have been mixed up a lot over the years and some people don't seem to realize that they don't actually need both. They need one or the other. And moreover, a lot of people uh, who have watched part one in this video and in this video series and looked at how they've set up their RAID configuration will wrongly assume that they currently have a backup in place. Let me explain. If we go into the storage manager here on this Synology NAS, this is a DS920 Plus, we can see down here, if we look at the available hard drives and SSDs, that we've got four drives here installed. Three of these drives have been placed in a RAID configuration. That RAID configuration, or this storage pool, is an SHR. An SHR that takes advantage of more than three disks is comparable in a number of ways to a traditional RAID 5. So if you're using a RAID 5, this is largely the same. Now the reason I bring this up is a RAID should never, ever, ever be considered a backup. What an SHR or RAID is, is a failsafe. It's a safety net. It is the ability for if data is on this whole NAS, if one of these drives breaks, as all mechanical things may do one day, your data will be still accessible in the RAID degraded state. Then when you introduce a new drive utilizing a hot spare, such as an available drive in your system, or introducing a brand new drive, then the system can rebuild and your data is safe. But again, this is not a backup, it's a safety net. A backup is when all of your data resides in another location. And if there isn't a complete collection of that data in another location, you don't have a backup. What you have is a, just the same data in another place. Now, the reason that's a distinctive difference is to give you a typical example. Say you own several mobile phones. These different mobile phones, all from different family members, are all backing up data to the NAS. Now in your head, you're backing up, as the expression just said. But the minute you delete data on your phone to make space, because in your head you have that data backed up onto the NAS, it's no longer a backup. What you have there is the single copy of all of that data on the NAS, and nowhere else. You have no backup, and if the NAS fails, the data is lost forever. That's why it's important to understand the difference between backups and synchronization. Now, a backup, as mentioned, is when you have a complete copy of the files that you have in one place stored in another place. Synchronization is when you have two areas that have storage, such as two folders on a computer, a folder on a computer, and a folder over on your phone, that have the same data between them that are updated at the same time when either folder is changed, either together or in one way or the other. That is synchronization. Now, the Synology NAS has numerous backup and synchronizing tools. If we have a look here and we move and go into the categories of backup, you'll see that a lot of the backup and synchronization tools are all kept together in the same kind of collection together because a lot of people will often utilize methods of synchronization to arrange a backup. So first up, we're gonna go through each of these tools right now. The active backup suite is the enterprise end of things. It allows you to have a single backup point and synchronization point where you can monitor all of your scheduled operations between different platforms, be they Mac systems, Windows systems, and more with increased Mac support in future versions, and all of them managed via a single portal. I will be showing you how to set one of those up shortly. 
Cloud synchronization is when you synchronize your NAS with a cloud provider, and therefore the data that lives on the cloud service provider, such as Dropbox, Google Drive, and more, that data will also live on the NAS. At the same time, you can arrange it that a folder on your NAS is synchronized with the cloud, therefore giving you that ability to have those synchronized folders and therefore create a backup from them. Next up, we've got Hyper Backup over here. Hyper Backup is the backup management tool from Synology. Don't think of this in terms of synchronization. Think of this as arranging all of your scheduled backups to different locations to and from the NAS. Next up, we can have a look at snapshot replication with snapshots arranged in the background, taking time managed kind of blueprints of all of your data within the NAS and all of that data um, being be able to be rotated back to a previous version, although you will need additional space in your NAS to store this. Along with this, there are other um, storage tools that manage um, backups and historic backups that can be archived for long storage. And this is where Hyper Backup Vault and replication servers in conjunction with those come into effect. Lastly, there's USB copy. Now, there is an element of USB backup management factored into Hyper Backup and indeed inside Active Backup. But USB copy is a USB dedicated backup tool. And we will be looking at that later on to show you a lot of how it's set up and what differentiates it from the other backup services that we're going to look at. So first up, let's take a look at snapshot replication. This is gonna run in, conjun in conjunction with your existing pools and volumes and is, although not the most rigid method to revert your data back to a previous version or to restore data, it is quite recommended to have snapshots running in the background, particularly if you're running a BTRFS system, as it has a lesser impact on the resources being utilized in your NAS in conjunction with snapshots. Now, let's open up the snapshot replication. Now, it's recommended before you proceed that you've watched my previous video in this series, series where I showed you guys how to set up your storage and your RAID for the first time, as well as mapped drives, shared folders, and of course, all of the different architecture within your NAS. Now we've opened up snapshot replication, we can see there our total available storage. There is the amount of storage that's being utilized, and if we go to the left-hand side and go to the snapshots option, we can see a list of all of our shared folders here on the NAS. Now there's lots available here, and I've already arranged um, a schedule for snapshots to happen in the background here on our active backup folder. But let's go down and find a new folder. Down here is our shared test folder, one that we set up in a previous video. We can click the arrow to go down, and it'll give us a little bit of information once the snapshot has begun about its overall history. If we go to the top here, we can take an immediate snapshot if we choose. Taking an immediate snapshot, if we give it a name such as share snap one, we can then click OK, and it will create a brand new snapshot in the background of this folder. And again, we can go into the historic um, area where we can look at different snapshots that have been created and revert to that older version that we've just taken if we choose. But the last thing we want to do is to rely on manual snapshots. What we want to do is have this happening automatically in the background. So in the event of something happening to our data, an accidental deletion, or data has been worked on and we want to revert to a previous version, we need to know that this is going to happen in the background automatically. If we head back into that snapshot folder, from here, make sure we select the share test again, this time clicking down, and go into snapshot list or going into calculate size, we can find out more information about how much space is going to be utilized. However, if we click settings, it will allow us to create a schedule of these snapshots. So for example, let's have a snapshot happen every day at 1 a.m. when no one's utilizing the system. We can set this up for certain days of the week or off peak periods. We can then say how often we want it, if do we want it hourly, or do we want it in some other frequency. From there, we click retention. 
The retention policy is how the system decides how many images to keep. And by images, I don't mean photos. I mean the blueprints that it's taking of this so it can revert to those earlier versions. We don't have to select this and then it will continue to create snapshots on our schedule um, indefinitely or we can go ahead and select enable retention policy, say that we want to keep the last 30 snapshots of this on a daily basis, that would be 30 days, or we can say that we only want to keep them for seven days, or we can do an advanced retention policy based on lots of different uh, variables. Now, by the retention policy, what that means is at the end of, say, the, 30, uh, the seven day period or the 30 snapshots period, it will overwrite the oldest snapshot and it will continue in rotation indefinitely. Consequently, if we go for seven days, it means that my snapshot after seven days will overwrite the first one. So it means I've got a seven day window of recovery to rely upon. If we click advanced, we can find out more about how we want them named. Do we want to utilize the naming schedule in the snapshots or we can revert much easier? And also, do we want the visibility of these snapshots to be accessible? I'm not gonna allow snapshot visibility, but that's up to you. Then we click OK. It will let us know that these settings will take effect immediately. And boom, we now have our schedule for that snapshot and it will continue to create snapshots of this that we revert back to. Do bear in mind, this will take up space on the system and you're advised during setup to allow space for those snapshots. On top of that, we can replicate snap snapshots from other areas as well as it, whether we access them locally via USB or remotely if we choose. On top of that, you've got the standard recovery options where it's listed from the ones that you're running. And again, you can go down, find out more information later as they go, select recover, and then you can choose the time manage backups as you choose. And again, lots of information and logs, and if any of these don't run, for one reason or another, you will be alerted here at the top panel. As you can see, alerts will come through as things are connected and things happen on the system. And if you're registered with the system with your email, as well as a remote connection, you will be notified. As mentioned though, snapshots are kind of um, a standard class of um, data uh, rec um, restoration policy that you should have on your NAS but it doesn't really count as a backup because if your system dies and you don't have the snapshots off system, they will be lost as well. They're more of a restoration policy than a backup or synchronization, of course. Let's move on to another method. Now, USB copy is a tool that I think most light, home, and even some small, medium business users should consider utilizing. It gives you the ability to store data on your NAS onto a USB drive in a number of, of rather customizable ways. And it does allow you to either leave the drive connected or periodically remove the USB drive before or after work or find ways to store that data onto another location or integrate it into other methods such as snapshot um, restoration in your system. Additionally, a lot of these services can be automated or set manually as you choose. Let's go through the US copy methods. Once you open up this tool, you'll be given three options immediately. Whether you want to import, export vi um, media files onto or from the USB connected drive. Do you want to automatically pull all data from that USB drive? Or do you want to export the data from your NAS onto the USB? The majority of these will have scheduling options and filters and customization options, but for now, let's go ahead and go for data export. I'm gonna go ahead now and step-by-step -step guide you through how to set up a scheduled backup onto the USB drive from the NAS onto the USB. From here, we give this a task. We're gonna call this NAS to USB. We're then going to select a source on the NAS that we want to back up from. So let's go ahead into my Plex and Media Images folder, and I'm going to select the Photo folder here. Again, there's five albums here. We're gonna select there. Then we have to select the destination on the USB. As you can see, I've got numerous USB drives connected. Let's go ahead and select this one here. 
Then we have to say what kind of copy method we want. Do we want multi-version, which is comparable to that of snapshots, where different versions of that backup will be maintained over time so you can revert back to them? Do you want a mirrored backup where the USB drive and the NAS folder, much like synchronization, will always be identical with their contents? Or do you want incremental, where if you are sending data to the NAS, not only will it double check what data has already been sent and therefore make it much quicker, not uh, sending over data that hasn't changed the USB, but also it means that as data is sent to the NAS, new data will be maintained on the USB, even if you delete it from the NAS, it will still exist on the USB drive. In my case, I'm gonna go with a straightforward incremental backup. Next, you can say whether you want to remove the original file structure in the destination folder and create a brand new one for time managed backups. Next, whether you want to delete the files from the NAS when you send them, again, that's up to you, but I wouldn't recommend it. And then what do you want to do with conflict policies if a file on the USB that you're sending over is identical? Do you want it to be renamed or do you want it to be overwritten? For now, I'm gonna go with overwritten. Click next, then you want to say how and when you want it to happen. So for example, do you want this um, backup operation from the NAS to the USB to happen every time the USB is plugged in? No manual intervention, it just does it automatically on its own. Next, after it's completed the job, do you want it to automatically eject the USB on a software level? You'll of course need to hardware physically remove the USB but it does give you the option there to make sure you can safely disconnect it without logging into the Synology NAS. Lastly, do you want to enable a schedule so that this backup, if you're leaving the USB connected at all times, will periodically action this backup? For me, I'm going to not allow it to disconnect and I'm gonna create a schedule. This schedule is gonna go on at midnight every single day. Next, we can say what kind of files we want to back up, audio, video, image, document, and other. You can even create your own um, uh, extension, such as .mp4 or .pdn, or any kind of expressive uh, extension, and add it here and make sure they're covered. So for example, you could make sure that you only ever, in my case, copy over um, photo files. You can even break it down into different kinds of photo file if you choose. I'm going to go ahead and proceed. And there you go. I've created my USB backup and I can change a lot of those options that I've gone through on the fly. Or I can go ahead and click run now as this backup is still going to continue at midnight every day. I don't know if you heard it, but that beep in the background was telling me the NAS has begun this backup operation. As you can see, you can add lots of backups. And again, if you want to repeat the same steps, you can go ahead and do an import from the USB onto the NAS where the steps are largely identical. It merely changes the source and the destination with all the steps remaining the same. And that's it. That is creating a USB backup. But what if your backups are a little bit more intense? What if the backups you've got in mind are looking at utilizing the likes of Google Drive and Dropbox. What if you want to back up from one NAS to another? Let's go into Hyper Backup. Now, Hyper Backup is a little bit more intense than what you've seen in USB Copy. Although a lot of the options remain the same, it has to be said that this covers a larger degree of platforms, as well as a lot more remote level backups, both over the network and via the internet. It doesn't have the enterprise feel and support of software as a service systems in active backup, but it does have a lot of different options open to you. Not to be mixed up with Cloud Sync, which is a synchronization tool with cloud platforms, Hyper Backup is far more targeted on backup operations. Let's open it up. The first thing it'll ask you when you open up the tool is what is the destination that you want to back up to, whether you're backing up somewhere else to this NAS or backing up this NAS to another location. As you can see, there are a lot of services I'm offered. Backing up between the NAS in different locations, maybe you have different volumes within your NAS or that USB whether you want to back up to another NAS on the local area network, whether you want to back it up as a single version, so this can be a one-off backup, or if you're utilizing Synology's own first-party cloud platform, C2. If you want to back up 
on a file level without utilizing a lot of uh, third or uh, first or third party services in an integrated server way and just want to use file management such as Windows Server, SMB and more, there are options for rsync, local copy and um, real-time remote replication. All of those built in there. Finally, you've got a bunch of options here to be utilized for cloud service providers to back up to the NAS. Let's go ahead and action a backup from this NAS onto another NAS on my network. So we're going to select remote NAS device. It'll ask me to enter the IP of the NAS that I want to back up to. Now, if you're backing up to a non-Synology NAS, it's recommended that you utilize the option rsync because it's the most reliable way to back up to other third-party servers. But if you're backing up to another Synology NAS, you can enter the IP here. Alternatively, click the down arrow and it will scan the local area network for any other Synology NASes that exist locally. You'll find in a moment I do have another Synology NAS based on my local area network on a temporary IP for this video. It's found it here, a DS1621XS. It will ask whether you want to utilize encryption. It will ask the port that you're going to be utilizing, which if you don't know, leave it as default. Whether you're going to be needing authentication, such as login information, which I will, which I'll enter in just a moment. And whereabouts on that NAS you want to send it to. I'm just going to log into this NAS now. Now I've logged into the NAS, this drop down menu will allow me to see a number of key folders on that NAS system there. I'm going to select the folder footage. From there, if it has no folder already in place, you can create a folder now. So I'm going to call this 920 test backup. If you have an existing task, you can link it to that, or you can go ahead and export shared folders if you choose. But for now, I'm going to click next. Now it will ask me, what are the folders on the local NAS system that I want to back up onto? So these are the folders that exist on this NAS that I'm going to send over. Once again, in my case, I'm going to go into the Plex Media Server folder. I'm going to select the folder Photos, and I'm going to click Next. But before I do so, let's go into the File Filters area, where once again, we can say if there's certain kinds of files and folders we don't want to utilize. So for example, if I don't want to back up uh, a prerequisite such as an MP4, I can go ahead and make sure that no files that contain the uh, extension MP4 are backed up onto. Oh no, it will, will include them, sorry, and you can exclude them below. Again, very straightforward if you're reading the screen, which I totally wasn't doing there, sorry about that. But that's your inclusion and your excluded files. And again, it's fairly evident and quite easy and straightforward to use. From there, click Next. Next, it will ask if there's applications on the NAS that you want to back up onto. So again, if you've got tools which have got their own config files, their own setup files on the NAS that you want to back up, you can go ahead and send those over. Next, we can talk about some of the configuration of our backup, such as the schedule, whether you want the data to be compressed on the fly, or, and again, that will depend on the power of your NAS, whether you want to be notified when it's done. Do you want it all to be logged all the way through, what you want the backup to be known as? Do you want integrity checks to happen on the backup? Do you want the backup to happen at a certain time of day, which I do, at 2 a.m.? And do you want it to be encrypted on the other end? For now, I'm going to click Next. Next, it will ask once again about the rotation of these backups. Do we want the backups to last for a certain number of days and overwrite the first generation, much like we saw in snapshots? If we go ahead and click Yes, it will allow us to go from the earliest versions and, in my case, much like before, I'm going to keep seven versions happening every day. And there you go with your timeline. Then I'm going to click Done. It's going to set this up in the background and it will ask us, do we want to action the backup for the first time now? Normally, I would recommend clicking yes. I'm going to click no because I've got a few other things to show you. But for now, when you're ready to start it, you can click backup or rely on the schedule that you may have created. It's really easy to add more backup operations too. If I click plus, I can go ahead and say I want to create another backup task. 
If, much like in my previous video, you've created an iSCSI target or a LUN, and remember I am going to be doing an enterprise grade storage guide video for Synology now shortly, you can find the option for target LUNs here. But for now, we're going to click Bake Data Backup Task, and we've already created a backup task here for backing up to another NAS, which again, if you want, you can do that in reverse if you choose by selecting Local USB Folder, and therefore, you can this time go in reverse and create a backup task on the remote NAS to come to your NAS here. But if we go ahead and go into Data Backup Task, we can go ahead now and create a backup from this NAS onto the cloud. Now do bear in mind when you're doing this not to get this mixed up with synchronization, something I will show you in a moment. This is about backing up onto a cloud service provider and perhaps you've got some space there with an inclusive, mo inclusive mobile phone pan plan or maybe you've just got some space with your email account. But let's go ahead with Google Drive. Click the Google Drive option and when you click next you should have a pop-up here on screen and it will ask you to log in with the email account registered with that cloud service provider. Here is our disposable NAS Compares account that we've been using previously, and I'm gonna go ahead and log in. Once you've registered and logged into your account, it will ask you if you're okay with allowing the Synology Hyper Backup tool to communicate with your cloud account. Go ahead and click Allow. <coughs> Then click Agree that it registers that internet IP. And from there, you go ahead and select the folder on the cloud that you want to back up to. In my case, there's lots of disposable folders that we've been using in other videos, but let's go ahead and select whichever one is the most appropriate for this backup as it goes through and checks online for the available folder structure. So for now, we should be able to find a folder about the 920 photos. From there, it will now create the uh, link and start setting up for the backup to this folder. We have to give it a name. So I'm going to call this one, same thing with the word cloud at the end. And again, we can go ahead, whether we want to utilize shared folders or link to an existing task, which we could do to link to that one. But I like to have all of my backup tasks independent. From here, it will then start to ask us where on the local NAS, once again, we want to back up from, i.e. what are the files on the NAS that we want to back up onto our Google Drive account. It's worth highlighting that whether you're using OneDrive, Backblaze, uh, Dropbox or more, the set setup steps here are largely the same. My network is quite busy at the moment as we conduct all the backups, so if that happens, simply go ahead and click Next again. It shouldn't happen for you. As you can see, it's once again listed all the available folders on my NAS. And once again, I'm gonna go straight into the Photos folder. I'm not the Photos folder, I'm gonna go into the Share Test folder. I'm gonna go into the Plex Media folder, and I'm gonna select Photos. And again, we can create the same filters that we had before if we choose. Then click Next. Then if you want, back up application data if you choose. And then create the schedule if you choose. So again, this one's gonna go off at 4 a.m. And again, whether you want integrity checks, whether you want all of those options done, all of that stuff is available to you there. Then backup rotation. Again, I'm going to go seven days. Click done. And there you go. It's just the same as the previous test we've done earlier on. And it will ask us whether we want to action this backup immediately. Again, my network is quite busy at the moment as I'm running lots of different tests with lots of different NASs. So this may not be as carefree and as straightforward um, for me as it will be for you. But as you see, it has gone through. I'm not gonna allow the backup to happen yet because I'm running lots of tests, but it's that straightforward. And now I've created so far in this video, snapshots in the background. I've created a retention policy for USB copies. I've created a hyper backup portal there for another NAS and onto the cloud. And I think for hyper backup, everything else is fairly self-explanatory. Let's talk a little bit about synchronization now with the cloud. Now, cloud synchronization has a lot in common with everything we've seen so far, but it's worth remembering once again that synchronization is about having two different storage locations having the same data and updated regularly, if not at the same time, than in a one or two way situation. It's not like backups, which are reliant on the data being 
sent over but largely running parallel. Now CloudSync has a lot in common with HyperBackup. It's an early application from Synology and if we go into it now you're going to see a lot of similarities. But this time rather than including a lot of information with regards to localized access such as USB or a NAS on the network, it has prioritized a lot of cloud platforms as you can see here with more services covered. So again if we go into the Google Drive option then click next it will once again ask us for permission to access the account. So follow those steps just like you did last time. Once you've logged into the account again, allow it to have permission and access and give trust to the Synology Cloud Sync application. Verify the IPs, click agree, and now it will once again go through the synchronization between the cloud provider and your NAS. We give it a name, such in this case the Google Drive. We then choose the path for the folder locally that we want to synchronize with our cloud platform. So in my case, I'm going to go into photo, or not photo, what am I going to do? I'm going to go into homes, whichever one has our Plex data, I may have forgotten. So we make our way in, in the shared test file, there you go, I got there in the end. Select photos. This time, just to make it quicker, I'm going to select one individual photo, uh, album now. I'm going to go for uh, when I watch the cricket. Select that. Now it's selected that local folder. Then we select a folder on the cloud. So again, it quickly checks with the cloud provider which folders are available on that cloud storage area. So in my case, once again, it's started listing them all. Once again, I'm going to find the Synology DS920 folder again. Go into there select there then whether we want it to be one way two way or purely synchronized not dissimilar to what we saw from the usb copy option there with bi-directional being in two ways only remote changes happening at one end or only new changes on this end being uploaded again very much depending on what you're going to need i'm going to go with local changes then you check if you want consistency checks to double check at the other end that the data has been sent over securely and um, safely then you've got encryption whether you want to enable that so data uh, intercepted mid transmission can't be accessed then whether you want to remove folders along the way whether you want it to have the same folders or create a, a rigid test folder structure there next you can create a schedule so again I'm going to create a schedule there where I don't want this synchronization to happen during work hours as it may affect performance so let's go ahead and remove uh, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5. So again, synchronization will happen all the time apart from that option there. Click Next. And then confirm all the settings you want. And again, you've got options there whether you want to create file filters, folder filters, and more. Then click Done. And there you go, we've now created our synchronization. It's not going to happen now because we're between 9 to 5 working hours. But out of working hours, it will constantly synchronize. And there you go, it's that straightforward. And again, you can run in multiple directions and edit a lot of this stuff on the fly as well as add other network providers. And again, the initial steps may change depending on the cloud service provider you are utilizing. But it's all very straightforward and once again, very easy to set up. And finally, that takes us on to the more enterprise area of things, and that is Active Backup Suite. Now, Active Backup Suite is broken down into three separate versions, though it's worth highlighting that you don't have to pay for any of them, not at least not initially, although some services on the Synology platform in different applications will allow you to have some licenses and then add some later on. I'm pleased to say Active Backup for pretty much the whole thing with a few minor exceptions is completely free. Now, if you open up Active Backup for Business, what you have here is a large and more overseeing area of backing up from other file service platforms. Although it will ask you to activate the account with an online service. So it will require you to create a remote access account on your Synology NAS in conjunction with a Synology account. Now, if you haven't already done that, we will be looking into a video where we create a Synology account and allow remote access and ultimately set the device up for you for access anywhere in the world. 
The reason we're not doing it yet is I want to go through all of the different services on the NAS and make sure your NAS is as secure as possible before showing you guys how to access remote um, uh, to uh, enable remote access on your NAS. Otherwise, by doing so, it can leave your NAS vulnerable if you don't do it properly. If we come out there, we can come out and have a little look at the options. Again, we've got Active Backup for Google Workspace. And if you aren't utilizing what was formerly known as G Suite and now Google Workspace with all of those accounts, email, and of course, all of those word processing document uh, informations in Google, um, uh, Google Docs, Google Sheets, and more, they can all be synchronized on an account and native level here on the Synology NAS, which again, I will include in the enterprise storage video coming soon. The same goes, of course, if you are utilizing Microsoft 365 along with OneDrive storage services and, of course, Microsoft Office Online. All of those, again, with similar steps that we will be covering in our enterprise video. The final backup and synchronization tool that I want to talk about is a little different from all of the others, and it's arguably one of the best that Synology have to offer, and it's known as Synology Drive. It crosses a line between file management, backups, and more, and is a great way to not only access the data on your NAS via the web browser, but also create a very, very um, intuitive synchronization strategy in your home or office environment. Now, Synology Drive is available in the Package Center, but it also includes Synology Drive Share Sync and Synology Drive Admin Console, and these will become clear what they're for in just a moment. But once you open up Synology Drive in the web browser, it will show you on screen the contents of what looks like your normal Google Drive or Dropbox. Now, at the bottom right, it will also invite you and recommend that you install the Synology Drive application for your client system, in my case, a Windows PC, something I've already done. If you want to do that, you can go ahead and click the pop-up that's on screen or head to Synology's website, find the NAS, go to Downloads, and from that section, you'll be able to find the available download for your desktop machine in the, in the Packages Center or Desktop Utility Center, and you install it, and then you've got Synology Drive. Now, the reason you would do that, if we open up Synology Drive on my PC here, is Synology Drive will allow you, let's close that there, Synology Drive will allow you to access the contents of your NAS on a local machine. So, for example, if we open them up here on my desktop, you can see that I've already created a synchronized shared folder here. And if we open up a lot of these options, which you won't have to do, we open up status, which might not be enabled on your PC immediately, but we're looking for the status folder. And as you'll see, if we scroll over, let's go for it there. Here is a series of clouds and ticks. Now these clouds and ticks are important because this allows you to say what folders you want synchronized on your local computer with the NAS and which ones you don't. You want to be able to see what's on the NAS, but you don't want to always store it. So for example, if I look at this D-Link router review that I did a while ago, some of these files here have got little clouds next to them. Those clouds mean that on the NAS, although this file is two, hundred, uh, it's two million kilobytes or two gigabytes in size, if I right click it and go to properties, it shows that it has zero bytes on the disk. In other words, it's taking no space up on my computer. But I can right click it, go to the Synology Drive option, and I can pin a copy if I choose to. If I do that, that file will always be not only on the NAS, but it will be constantly synchronized and available offline on my PC. And it will make sure that it never disappears. But otherwise, what will happen is as a file is used less and less, if I delete it from my computer, it will then still be visible on the file structure of my PC, but at the same time, it won't take up any space. Now, whereas these folders here have a cloud, some of them don't. Some of them have a green tick. That means that I've accessed this file recently and it's keeping a local copy on my PC. So again, if I right click it, and go to properties, we can see that this file is indeed 6.72 megabytes and it's taking up 
6.72 megabytes on my disk. It's a local copy. And if I choose to, I can right click, go to Synology Drive, and this time I can purge that copy. I can make sure that I don't keep a local copy. It deletes the data from my local computer, but I still have access to its visibility, at least on uh, information level on my computer, but it doesn't take up any space. Also, I can restore to previous versions that I'll show you in a moment, as well as create a shareable link. It's a great tool, originally designed in conjunction with Microsoft's own 365 services, and there is still work in DSM-7 to enable this feature, uh, right now at least, at the end of 2021, to work with Mac OS. So, that is basically Synology Drive's synchronization locally, but there's so much more to it than that. Because not only do you create um, locally on your computer different file folder structures that will synchronize on your PC, such as creating multiple shared folders and synchronize folders on one computer that could be shared with others, but you can create one team folder here on the Synology NAS system, and that team folder can then be synchronized with Synology Drive on numerous local computers, PCs and Macs, all of them with the advantages of Synology Drive there. It's a really straightforward tool, and although it's at its best when you're using internet connectivity to synchronize it, you can do it locally over the network on its own. As you can see, that shared folder that we've been utilizing till now is here. Another great advantage of Synology Drive, at least in the web browser, if you're someone that's coming from Google Drive or Dropbox, is that you can access the folder of your NAS rather than utilizing this uh, kind of computer desktop GUI, a much more familiar folder structure as found in those third-party cloud services. So for example, if I go into the Photos folder, and then in here, go into that Cricut folder that I mentioned earlier, we can go ahead and change the view if we like, rather than in a folder structure, we can go for thumbnails. And in the background, as you can see, the system is now indexing a lot of the folders and stuff that I'm adding there in the background. So again, we can go into a folder, a file or folder, such as a picture of me and my father-in-law here, open it up in the browser, and we can find out information about this if we choose. And again, lots of photography information, readily accessible, much like you'd find in the multimedia applications on your Synology NAS. And again, you can download a local copy, print it, share it with a user, and more. All of that available there. Now, if you have existing folders on your NAS that you want to add to Synology Drive, this is where that other tool comes in, Synology Drive Admin Console. Now from here, what we can do is add a new folder. So if we go to the team folder, it will list all of the available folders on your NAS. This will not include USB folders. So for example, we want to add this surveillance folder. So we want to make sure other users on the network can access the surveillance recordings if we choose. So we can go ahead, click Enable. Then we can say if we want to keep versions, which of course we do, and again, we'll stick with our original rules, seven versions, whether we want to delete the earliest version or use intelligent versioning where it won't update old data or overwrite old data that hasn't changed or create a regular time-managed or version-managed rotation. Click OK. And there you go it's now created it. Now do bear in mind that read-only privileges here will still be in effect if you created that in individual groups or users. As you can see, we've now added surveillance to our shared drive folder. So again, right now it's not visible, but if we refresh this page, from here it will continue to list all of the folders that are available in the team folder there. We click down, and as we can see, the surveillance folder has been created. Although there's nothing in it right now, we can see that the surveillance folder has now been added to our available Synology Drive folder list. And then from within the Synology Drive application, it allows us to add a brand new task to our local machine if we choose, and add these files and folders very easily from that NAS. Now again, the layout will differ depending on your NAS system, but nonetheless, this will allow you to add these files and folders from Synology Drive onto a local pinned folder 
on your NAS and from there you can then share it with other team members from the NAS onto your local PC and have a great multi-user network of synchronized folders. Again, not to be confused with backups. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail about Synology Drive because I have done multiple videos in the past showing you how to create a Synology Drive synchronized setup with the Windows desktop clients and more. I recommend you check that out as I have both a DSM 7 version and a DSM 6.2 version and they both run almost longer than this video so far. So I do recommend you check those out. But let's end things here. This has been a whole series of uh, backup and synchronization tools for Synology DSM 7. In our next part, we're going to be looking at multimedia. We've still got enterprise videos on storage and backups to come. And those videos, although they're going to be targeted a lot more at rack station systems and a lot more enterprise level utilities, may be of use. So I recommend you check those out. But do stay tuned for part three in this series. I promise you won't be waiting for a long time as you've done with this version. And it will be just as informative covering a number of different services and different file types. If you've enjoyed this, click like. It helps me understand what I'm doing right and makes each part better than the last. And of course, click the bell to be notified as each new part arrives and subscribe for more informative videos on not only Synology NAS, but all things data storage. Otherwise, thanks so much for watching. There's a free advice section below over at NAS Compares where if you're a home or business user, Two humans, me and Eddie the web guy, will help you every step of the way with your setup. Just use the free advice section. It's right there to use. We don't do anything with your email. There's donate buttons. Use them. Ignore them. It's up to you. But otherwise, I'll see you on the next video.